Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sanders Facts. Hello, hello, everyone. What is going on? Welcome in to the latest edition of the Xander's Facts Podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander, and this is episode 83 of the podcast here on Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. Thank you all for listening. It is Thanksgiving week here in the United States. Everyone is excited to eat some turkey later this week, so we're kind of taking thanks chill on this podcast, on episode 83 of the podcast. Last week, if you didn't know, we had our World Cup preview podcast, which we talked about, and now the games have started. So we're going to be talking this week about some of those games. A little recap of the first three days of the World Cup, what's been going on on the field, and yes, there's been more stuff that's been going on off the field that we're going to talk about here on this podcast. So we're going to talk more World Cup this week because that is what's going on that is what has got basically my full attention right now so that's what we're talking about this thanksgiving week on wednesday november 23rd on episode 83 of the xander's facts podcast but remember before we begin if you like the xander's facts podcast if you think you're gonna like all the facts on this week's edition remember to follow this podcast download this episode episode 83 rate and review the podcast go on all your socials Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Sanders Facts is there. That's Sander with a Z. And most importantly, tell all your friends. Spread the facts! Sanders Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about Sanders Weekend Facts, our weekly newsletter that comes out on Substack every Sunday morning. Check it out. The Sanders Facts link tree has all the Sanders Facts that you need. And tell all your friends and yourself about ZandersFacts.com, which is the home of the Xander's Facts shop, which is the exclusive home of Xander's Facts merch. Get all your merch, support the facts, and support your closet, because Xander's Facts merch is stylish. Debatable. Just wanted to let you know. So check it out, xandersfacts.com. Check out all the facts. You can get all the facts, too, on xandersfacts.com. So, this week, not that big of a podcast. We've had major podcasts the last few weeks on this podcast. But not this week, because we are just taking things chill, talking about what's been going on in the World Cup this week. Last week, you need to check it out. If you haven't listened last week, was our World Cup preview with our Xander's Facts soccer analyst, Emma Adams. We previewed every team, all 32 teams, what was going to happen. We made our predictions for what was going on on the field, and we also talked about everything going on off the field. So a little bit of an update this week on the podcast, this Thanksgiving week. And by the way, last year on Thanksgiving week, we had our Green Thanksgiving podcast, which I think was one of the best podcasts we've done on Xander's Facts. We talked everything about green energy, everything you need to know. Check out that podcast if you have it. Eighth Green Thanksgiving from Thanksgiving week, November 2021. Go check that out if you haven't listened to it. But this week, we're not talking about great energy. We're talking about soccer, or as some people call it, football. Nope. It's time to get everyone updated on everything that's going on with this World Cup. Three days into it. The games have begun. They begin on Sunday. And still, that is not the only big story. That's not the only thing we're going to be talking about, too. Plus, not even just off the field, all the stuff with FIFA and Qatar we've been talking about. There were major news in the soccer world that dropped on Tuesday. Cristiano Ronaldo, who plays for Manchester United, or did, had his contract terminated by Manchester United because you remember, we kind of talked about this last week, and if you read Zader's Weekend Facts, you know about this. Cristiano Ronaldo had an interview with Piers Morgan where he basically dissed his manager, Eric Ten Hag, and the club, Manchester United. So they have gotten rid of him. So he is now gone. He can sign with anybody, basically, in the world. That includes MLS, where I guess he could go, but his ego is a major issue, and also his wages. He's going to demand a lot of money, and there's not going to be a lot of clubs who are going to say, hmm, what just happened with your last club? I don't know if we'll pay you. He's 37 years old. He's still really good. He's one of the best players who's ever played. Of course, he's 37 now. But still, we'll have to see what happens with Ronaldo, and he's about to start playing for Portugal 
in the World Cup, so he's in Qatar right now. But also with Manchester United, the Glazer family, the family that owns Manchester United, announced that on Tuesday, they are now potentially looking into selling the club. And we just had a big announcement the other week about Fenway Sports Group potentially selling Liverpool. So that's two big Premier League clubs that could now be up for grabs. And Chelsea was just sold to an American, Todd Bowley, this past year. A lot of movement going on. That's pretty important because if the owners don't invest in the club, which a lot of Manchester United fans don't think that the Glazers invested in the club, if the owners don't invest in the club, then they're you know, not going to do so well. So we'll see what happens with those two things. Those are just Premier League stuff way off the field. Premier League's not coming back for another month. So let's get back to this World Cup. Last week on the preview podcast, we started with what was going on off the field. Then we went to what's on the field. But let's start with what's going on on the field. Because finally, finally, we don't have to make predictions anymore. We can talk about the real thing. Because real soccer has been played on grass. Yay! Can you believe it? In stadiums which were made by migrant workers, which, yeah. But they're still playing soccer, which is very exciting. 16 of the 32 teams have hit the pitch starting on Sunday up until Tuesday. Obviously, when you're listening to this podcast on Wednesday or beyond, there's been other stuff that's happened. But up until Tuesday is what we're talking about on this podcast. So 16 teams, eight games have been played. Four groups have now played their first match. And let's talk about them a little bit. Let's start going in chronological order of how they've happened. We'll start with the only game that happened on Sunday. The hosts, Qatar, facing Ecuador in Group A. Back on the preview podcast, I said, "Mm, why be watch out for Qatar? They were okay, at least, in the Gold Cup, and they won the Asian Cup, but they were not so good in the opener of the World Cup. They lost 2-0 to Ecuador. Ecuador's Enter Valencia got a brace. He got a 16-minute penalty and a 31-minute goal. And there was a questionable disallowment of a goal by VAR for Ecuador. So it could have been 3-0. But Qatar just did not look good at all. That, uh, who knows what's going on there. But Ecuador actually looked okay. You can't really take much out of that because Qatar looked terrible, which is what kind of happened in our next match. We'll talk about that in a second. But Ecuador positions themselves well for Group A, which also includes Netherlands and Senegal, who also played each other, which we'll talk about in just a second. But that was the first match of this World Cup. Then we go to Monday, where there were three matches, beginning with England and Iran in Group B, a match that U.S. fans paid very close attention to. I know I did because these two teams are in a group. And the result, well, 6-2 to England. Six goals tied for their most out of any game in any World Cup. It's a fact. England scored six, including five goal scorers, Jude Bellingham, Bakaya Saka, Raheem Sterling, Marcus Rashford, and Jack Grealish. And Jude Bellingham looked Pretty good. Bakayo Saka, of course, got the brace. He got two goals. Jack Grealish scored in the 90th minute after coming on, and he had a pretty nice goal celebration, which actually had a bigger meaning, which you should go look up because it's actually very nice. But they were playing Iran. This game was very strange. First off, there were 24, 24 total minutes of stoppage time that were awarded. 14 minutes of stoppage time in the first half. 10 minutes of the second half, and they played more than 10 minutes in the second half because Iran scored two goals in the 65th minute and in the 103rd minute, Mehdi Tarimi scored both and he scored a penalty in the 103rd minute that was reviewed by VAR and given to Iran. But there were a lot of people who were just like 24 minutes of stoppage time. That wasn't just what was what happened. That was what was awarded. So when the 45 minutes hit at halftime, or at the end of the first half, it wasn't halftime yet, they said 14 minutes left to play of added time, which was ridiculous. Now, in the 45 minutes of the first half, England scored three goals, of course, but also 
Iran had an injury to their goalkeeper, so they had to bring in their backup goalkeeper for majority of the game, and then England scored six goals on him, which was just so no. But apparently, what they're trying to do in this World Cup is that the ref actually has to account for, like, every second of stoppage time. So if you watch normal club soccer, if you watch the Premier League or MLS or something, usually it'll be like one, two, three, four minutes of stoppage time, which is kind of a generalization. The referee will not really counting every single second that ticks by of non-playing time. In this World Cup, apparently that's what the referees are supposed to do. And there were 14 minutes in the first half of the first 45 minutes in the England-Iran game where soccer was not being played. So that's basically what happened there. It was very strange. England looked really good. Iran looked really bad, though. I think England was just kind of racketed up on them. And Iran, there's a lot of stuff going on with Iran. They have this new manager who's kind of been brought in because the team was struggling under their old manager players were not liking it so they bring in a new manager just a couple months before the world cup or a manager who's been the manager of iran before but you see how this turns out there's a lot of stuff going on in iran right now the players actually protested they did not sing the national anthem when it was being played before the game in solidarity with those protesters in iran so maybe something like that is going to them we said Group B is the best group, according to FIFA rankings, because even Iran is in the top 20 of FIFA rankings, but they did not look like it. And England, for all the crap we've given England about the Nations League, they sucked in the Nations League. They have not looked good since the Euros last summer, 2021. They looked pretty good. Now, of course, Friday's game, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. I'm not as pessimistic about Friday's game as some might have you think after these last few games. We'll talk about that in a little bit. U.S.-England on Friday. We'll talk about that. The other two matches of the day on Monday were Senegal and Netherlands. That was the other game in Group A. Senegal learned just a couple days before the World Cup, after we had taped our podcast preview, that their star player, Liverpool's Sadio Mane, was not going to be able to play in the World Cup because he got injured. So they don't have him. They didn't really look the same. It actually looked even for a while. It didn't look like the Netherlands was doing too much in that game. But they get two goals. They win 2-0. Cody Gakpo in the 84th minute. And then Klaassen in the 99th minute. Of course, that's stoppage time. There you go. The 99th minute. So it actually, and the commentators were talking about this, it looked like that might just head to a draw, which... Ecuador would have been in a pretty good position if that happened, but it didn't. Netherlands broke free at the end, and you've got to think Netherlands are probably what was expected going to get through this group, but they didn't really look that impressive. And of course, they didn't make the 2018 World Cup. They finished third in 2014, though, and they're one of the best teams in the world, too. But we'll see what goes on with Netherlands and LVG and the rest of that group. Because they are going to be playing Ecuador, which we'll see what happens with Ecuador. That could be a really good game. And they're also going to be playing Qatar. So right now, Netherlands and Ecuador are on top of Group B with three points. Senegal and Qatar are at the bottom with zero. Now, Senegal still has a chance to get through. They need to beat Qatar, of course. They also need to beat Ecuador. And potentially, they need to beat them by a couple goals in order for goal differential. But we'll see what happens there. Then, oh, the other game on Monday. America! The United States men's national team against Wales. The game we have waited eight long years for since the round of 16 match in Brazil against Belgium. In summer of 2014, it has been eight years since the United States played in a World Cup game. Man, that was rough. And that first half was pretty impressive for the United States. They had a ton of possession. They looked dangerous on a lot of their chances, which, by the way, Wales were prepared to let them have a lot of possession because they wanted to defend and then counter, which ultimately worked for them later in the second half. But the U.S. looked dangerous. They had a couple chances, which really uh, they should have converted on in that first half. And they did... On one of them, with Christian Pulisic getting the ball 
and racing towards the center where he finds Timothy Way, who glides the ball just past the keeper into the net. It is 1-0 USA in the 36th minute. It was a banger of a goal, let me tell you. That was some stylish from the son of the president of Liberia, Timothy Way, the son of George Way, if you didn't know. It's true! And after that, oh boy, we were feeling good, US fans, let me tell you. And there were a lot of chances to score some other goals, some chances they should have converted. The US definitely went out to the wings with Way on the right, Pulisic on the left. They definitely tried to kick in a lot of crosses. Some of them hit. Josh Sargent had a pretty good chance after. Well, I don't know what happened there, but it was a cross in, and Wales defender hit the ball. He headed it towards his own net. The keeper had to react suddenly to stop the ball, and then Josh Sargent was there. He could have scored. There were a bunch of chances in the first half, including at the beginning of the second half. But Wales brought in Kiefer Moore at the start of the second half as their substitution, and that really changed the game because Wales started to go on to the attack they had a couple chances. Matt Turner had to make a couple of really good saves. And then, 80th minute around there, Gareth Bale tries to get the ball. His back is turned to the goal. He's in the box. And Walker Zimmerman, who's one of the center backs for the U.S., who was basically, I mean, everybody knew he was going to start. He has played wonderfully for the U.S., despite the fact he plays in MLS. But he made a sliding tackle where he basically went through Gareth Bale. Now, you can't do that. It's a foul, and the ref called it. In the box, it was a penalty. Gareth Bale was obviously going to take it. He did. Matt Turner picked the correct side. He even got a hand on it. But Gareth Bale absolutely smashed that penalty kick. It was 1-1 easy for Wales. And Wales even looked like there were chances... They could win that game. I mean, the U.S., basically the last 20 minutes of the game, their offense just really didn't look non-existent. Their passes were going to Wales players. Weston McKinney, by the way, who's been an anchor in the middle, in midfield, came off and looked like he was injured. Doesn't look like he's 100%. He was coming off injury from Juventus anyway, so that doesn't look good. But Tyler Adams had a wonderful game in the midfield. Christian Pulisic had the assist, but... Uh, not maybe after that. I mean, didn't seem to be too great. Josh Sargent started at striker. We had the question of who was going to start at striker. It was Norwich City's Josh Sargent. He played okay, I thought. Maybe not the greatest, but the other strikers you've got. Haji Wright came in for him later in the game. Did not look good at all. And then later in the match, Jordan Morris comes in on the wing. Doesn't look good. MLS product. Brendan Aronson comes in. Medford Messi. Uh, I mean, he was okay. The subs really came a little late. Everybody was really clamoring for subs early in the second half when it kind of looked like the tides were starting to turn for Wales, especially Kiefer Moore was an excellent sub for them at halftime for Dan James. It looked like that totally revamped what Wales was doing. And really, Greg Berhalter just waited. The U.S. offense just was really not doing anything in that second half, except for at really the beginning. And it really slowed down from there. It looked like some bad passes. They just didn't look like they were communicating as much. You need subs, or he calls them solutions. And they came late, and they didn't really make an impact. And Wales, Wales looked like they were going to score. They finally did on a penalty. And that's basically what happened. 1-1, one, one, the final score for the U.S and Wales for the first U.S. World Cup game for the men since 2014, but the first World Cup game for Wales since 1958. Cool facts, bro. And it looked like there were a lot of Wales fans there like, we're going to relish this moment. First time since 1958. Yeah. So it was 1-1. Both teams got a point. And I think coming into that match, if you said the U.S. is going to get a point from this match, but you England's going to have three, and then you go into that England match with you having one point, England having three, you're going to say, okay, we can do that. But really, the reaction from me was disappointing, and from a lot of people was disappointing, because the U.S. just looked like the better team. They just did not convert on their chances in the final third. 
once they did, and it was on a breakaway. But, and there are crosses on their set pieces. Set pieces in international soccer are huge. But really, Christian Pulisic really underdelivered on his corners, especially. Did not look that great. They were low. Wales easily defended them. It just didn't look that great in the final third. But everywhere else, we kept possession, which Wales were going to, you know, they wanted us to. They were going to let that happen. But our midfield was MMA, Eunice Musa, Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams. McKinney kind of, you know, trailed off at the end. He was kind of injured. But Adams and Musa were great. The midfield was great. Tagging third. eh. And the defense was pretty good, too. Remember, I said last week, Aaron Long might start at center back. And Gareth Bale might just say, oh, Aaron Long, I remember you from MLS. You're not that great. I'm just going to go around you and score. It wasn't Aaron Long. Thankfully, it was Tim Ream, the 35-year-old Fulham center back who started, and he did really well. And Walker Zimmerman did really well, too, except for giving up that penalty. But he did really well in that match. He's done really well previously. He does not deserve to get benched, especially for someone like Aaron Long because of that. And your wingbacks, basically, Serginia Dest on the right, Jedi Anthony Robinson on the left— Robinson and Reem are both at Fulham, and they start, they have that connection, and Jedi Robinson, Anthony Robinson, Jedi's his nickname, Anthony's his real name, Anthony Robinson looked really good on the left, really helping out Pulisic. Serginio Dest is a better player than Anthony Robinson, but like McKinney, he was coming off injury, he didn't look as bad as McKinney at the end, he came off, he didn't really come off limping like McKinney did though, but He'll probably, he may start for England, we'll see, but he'll probably play better for that match. Just kind of, you know, he played well, just not the level you have seen or expect from Serginho Dest. But the defense, I thought, played well. They were just harassed at the end, though, which was the problem because the offense really wasn't doing anything and Wales finally started attacking. The thing in international soccer is the U.S. have had success, relatively, in the World Cup. They've gotten out of every World Cup they've been to in the last four or five of them, I believe, because they don't play the way they're playing right now. They sit back, defend, and then they counter. Remember that Belgium game in 2014? Tim Howard set the record for (laughs) most saves in a World Cup game in that 16 saves in a game in the World Cup against Belgium because the U.S. just really parked the bus and defended. And then they countered. They got a goal out of that too, but Belgium got two in that round of 16 game, which was whatever. But that's really the way the the U.S. has played a lot of times in the World Cup of four. This year, it's really, it's a new young core, which is more attacking focus. So they're going to try and keep possession more so they can have more chances rather than just having a few chances and making a low scoring game What Greg Berhalter wants to do is, it can be a high-scoring game, because the U.S. are going to have a lot of chances. It's kind of what, if you've watched Leeds this year, it's kind of what Jesse Marsh is doing at Leeds. It's kind of frantic, it takes a lot of energy, and then, kind of at the end of the game, you're going to kind of lose that energy, and the opposing team's going to go and say, all right, it's our turn. And that's what Wales did, that's what a lot of teams have done to Leeds this year, that's what Wales did in this game. And from a Wales perspective, you're pretty happy that you got one point, considering all the chances that the U.S. had basically just crosses. There was only one shot on goal for the U.S., and it was the goal. They did not have any other shots on goal. It was just the chances, the crosses into the box that were headed away and defended well by Wales. Wales defended well in that game. It was just the U.S. had so many chances, which makes me less pessimistic than some about the England game, which is happening on Friday. Are you sure? Because, you know... That's the big game, which we're actually going to get to in a second. So I'll talk about that in a second. But also, one note, the U.S. was up 1-0 at halftime because of that 36-minute goal from Tim Weah. But the last time that the U.S. did not win a World Cup match that they led at halftime in was in 2002 in the group stage against South Korea, who were one of the hosts in that World Cup back in 2002. Gash facts. I mean, they drew, they didn't lose, but... They didn't win either. So 1-1 for the U.S. and Wales. And we'll talk about that England game and 
the upcoming games this week in just a second. But Tuesday's games, because <laughs> we got some other stuff to talk about with Tuesday's games, starting with Argentina and Saudi Arabia. I set my alarm clock for 6 a.m. I mean, I'm on the East Coast, so Eastern time. 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning. I wake up. I look at my phone. It's 1-0 Argentina. I'm like, okay, they're going to win this game. Go to bed. Wake up. It was a couple hours later. I look at the score. 2-1. Saudi Arabia, 2-1. Saudi Arabia beat Argentina. Absolutely bonkers. One of the largest upsets in the history of the World Cup. It was the largest upset, according to the odds makers, in the World Cup since 2006. Absolutely insane. And the thing is, Argentina, I mean, they weren't that bad. Lionel Messi scored. He got a penalty in the 10th minute, which put them up 1-0. And they looked like they had a bunch of chances. They actually put the ball in the back of the net a ton of times. The issue is, all of those got called back for being offside. So that was the issue for Argentina. But they looked absolutely dominant in the first half. Second half comes, and it's like a switch flips. Within five minutes, we get a goal from Al Shiri for Saudi Arabia in the 48th minute. Five minutes later, Al Dossari in the 53rd minute scores, puts him up 2 1. Absolutely stunned. Argentina could not come back from that. 2 1 to Saudi Arabia. That's insane, not just in the history of the World Cup, but also. In this World Cup, Argentina, out of one match, have zero points with two to go. There's always, I mean, we, we can make all the predictions we want, but when it comes time to playing the game, you got to execute. That's why we love the World Cup, because anything could happen. And this just happened. A major upset. Argentina, fourth, I believe, in the FIFA rankings. Saudi Arabia, 51st. Holy cow. Could this be the shocker of the World Cup? Could this prevent Argentina in Lionel Messi's final World Cup? They call him the Argentinian Aronson. Nice try, buddy. In his final World Cup, could this be the thing that ends it? That they don't get out of the group stage? They've got two more games, so obviously they can, but th it's much tougher when you lose a game to get out of the group. We'll see what happens there, because there's two other teams which we're going to talk about, which also played on Tuesday. But Denmark, nil. Tunisia, nil. Right after that, the first scoreless draw of the World Cup. And you've got to say, that's pretty disappointing for Denmark. In Group D, you kind of would like a win against Tunisia, and they got a draw. So they got a point, but not three. And then, the other match in Group C, Mexico and Poland which I actually was up and able to watch. Mexico, nil. Poland, nil. But Poland had the best chance because they had a penalty, which Robert Lewandowski took, and was saved by Memo Ochoa, who always performs well for Mexico. Mexico, I thought, performed better than I expected. And Poland performed worse than I expected, except for that penalty. They didn't really challenge Ochoa that much. And actually, after that penalty, it looked like Mexico was going to score because they had a couple of really nice chances. It looked like they had all the momentum, but they couldn't put one in the back of the net. So, nil-nil, and that's probably disappointing for both teams because Poland was expecting one from the penalty, and then Mexico was expecting another. So, that's probably disappointing for both. But that's a game where both teams were thinking, all right. Argentina lost, so they have zero points. Saudi Arabia is at the top of the group right now with three points. This is our chance. If we get three points here, we are breezing. But both those teams thought that. Both those teams only got a point. So Group C. Group C is really interesting because Argentina still looks like the best team of the group, even though they lost to Saudi Arabia. But I thought they played okay. And they have Messi, of course. Mexico and Poland. Mexico looked better than I thought they would. And Mexico is probably in a better position to advance. Of course, Mexico has advanced in their last seven World Cups, but they have not gotten to the quarterfinals. They've been stuck in that fourth game 
The round is 16. This is a fact. We'll see what happens here, but that 0-0 draw with the Argentina loss is probably better for Mexico than Poland. And Mexico looked better than Poland on Tuesday. And then the final game is the defending champion, Les Bleus de France, taking on the Socceroos of Australia in Group D. And let me tell y'all, this game started, and in the ninth minute, Craig Goodwin scored for Australia. 1-0 to the Socceroos. Oh my gosh, let me tell you, I was hype. Well? All those Socceroos celebrating, jumping and celebrating was quickly brought to a halt in the 27th minute by Adrian Rabiot, who scored for France to tie it. And then five minutes later, Olivier Giroud scored in the 32nd minute. And then France took the lead at 2-1 at halftime. Everybody's like, all right, this is France's game. They look comfortable. And in the second half, they score two more goals. Giroud scores and Kylian Mbappe scores. Giroud scored twice. He has 51 all-time goals for France. That is tied for the most all-time with Thierry Henry. So if Giroud scores another, he passes Henry. And Mbappe, I've got a stat for him. Here comes a fact! Only Pele, Mario Kempis, and James Rodriguez have scored more World Cup goals before turning 24 years old than Kylian Mbappe, and there's probably more to come for France. They've got Denmark and Tunisia left in the group. Now, France, of course, have the World Cup curse. Not since 2002 has a World Cup defending champion made it out of the group. Can France be the ones to do it? Well, they looked pretty dominant against Australia, the Socceroos. I would bet my money that France are getting out of that group. and potentially going far. They're going to try and be the first defending champion since the 60s. And, I mean, they look like one of the top teams in the tournament. France rolling over the Socceroos, which was pretty sad. So that's basically the eight games that have happened. We've got eight more games that are happening Wednesday and Thursday. And then Group A and Group B are back on Friday. But Wednesday, we've got new teams coming onto the pitch. Morocco and Croatia at 5 a.m. Obviously, you've probably already known that Morocco and Croatia have played by the time you're listening to this podcast because it comes out at 5 a.m. on Wednesday. Germany, Japan, Spain, Costa Rica, and Belgium and Canada. Salute to our northern neighbors because that's going to be a tough game. But I like Canada this year. They look really good. So I'm rooting for my Canadian brethren. So groups E and F start on Wednesday. And then the last two groups, G and H. Begin play on Thursday, beginning at 5 a.m. with Switzerland and Cameroon, 8 a.m. Uruguay and South Korea, Portugal, Ghana at 11, and at 2 p.m. Eastern, Brazil and Serbia. The favorites to win this World Cup, Brazil, in action on Thursday. And then Friday, (laughs) by the way, Thursday is Thanksgiving, Black Friday, 5 a.m., Wales and Iran. Now, This is a very big game for the United States men's national team because we drew Wales and we're playing Iran next week. So we might actually have to get up at 5 a.m. I haven't haven't been planning on getting up at 5 a.m. for these games, but Wales-Iran's pretty big. Might have to get up at 5 a.m. Terrible. 8 a.m., the hosts, Qatar, take on Senegal. Netherlands take on Ecuador at 11, and then 2 p.m., The match we have waited for since it was announced, it was happening since it was announced that these two teams would be in the same group, the United States take on England at 2 p.m. Eastern on Friday. Oh my gosh, that's a game. That's a fact! And let me just tell y'all, because I said I'm not as pessimistic as some others about the U.S. for this game, because England for scoring six goals and doing all they did against Iran, didn't look the greatest. They still had some weaknesses. They gave up two goals. Of course, one of those was a penalty. And the U.S., really, in the first half, they dominated. I mean, the, in the first half, they absolutely dominated. They looked incredible in the first half. Just the only issue was they just could not convert on their chances. They could not get the ball in the box. They couldn't get a header 
in the box for most of that first half and second half. They just need to convert on their chances. And they're not going to have as many chances against England either. Because England, you know, are going to want to have a possession too. So I don't think England are going to blow the U.S. out of the water. I think both teams will score. And it could be a draw. But I do like the chances for the United States. I think that in some ways, definitely in this way, Argentina was definitely overlooking Saudi Arabia. Could the U.S. have been overlooking Wales? I don't know. England definitely were not overlooking Iran, that's for sure. But in that second half, the U.S. kind of looked sluggish, tired. It was a lot different than in the first half. If we see the U.S. second half against England, they will get smashed. But if we see the U.S. first half against England, it will be very close and very exciting to watch. I am very excited to watch that game because you know what? Even if the U.S. lose, they're not out of it. It largely depends on what happens with Wales and Iran too. But if even if the U.S. lose, they're not out of it. They've still got another game to play on Tuesday of next week against Iran and Wales play England that day too. So it's not over even if they lose, but they would really like a point. Or three! We can still get three! I am not giving up hope. All the English, oh boy, they are getting cocky. They were kind of, it seemed like a little weird that they were very excited about their team, even after the Nations League was kind of, eh, not doing so well. And you kind of heard that on this podcast from the England fan who was on this podcast. But now, oh my gosh, we scored six goals. We are the greatest team ever. We will defeat the United States and it will not be close. They will be crying after the game. During the game, they will be crying. We are the greatest ever. They're really cocky right now. They might need to be humbled a little bit by the country that humbled them in 1776 and then again in 1812. So I'm just saying. By the way, two matches the U.S. and England have played in the World Cup. USA, one win, one draw, no wins for England. Just so you know. That's a big fact. So there you have it. That's basically what's happened on the field in a preview of what's to come in these next few days at this World Cup in Qatar. Yes, it is in Qatar, but I am fascinated with what is going on on the field. It is exciting if you haven't watched. And by the way, all the matches of the World Cup can be watched in the U.S. on your TV on Fox or FS1 in English and Telemundo or Universo in Spanish. But it's not just the stuff that's going on on the field. It's the stuff that's going on off the field. So to close off this podcast, let's get to that stuff. Because I talked a lot about everything that was going on off the field last week. But I want to add to that because we've learned some new stuff about the stuff that's been going on off the field. It was a majorly controversial World Cup before the first whistle blew. And that controversy has not stopped. And in fact, we have some new controversies. How about that? So first off, let's just start with a name I just mentioned, Fox. Fox Sports. They are the English media rights holder for all FIFA events in the U.S. until 2026. If you are watching the World Cup in English in the United States, you are watching on Fox Sports. But a lot of television viewers notice that Fox has not talked about any of Qatar's off-the-field controversies at all, which we knew was going to happen because they said before the World Cup started, months before actually, we're not going to talk about that stuff. We're going to leave that to other journalistic entities. And there have been a lot of journalistic entities which have covered the off the field issues very well. However, what Fox has done is seemingly been very kind to Qatar. They've shown them off in a pretty kind, pretty positive light. And that might seem confusing. Why would Fox be doing, seemingly, it sounds like, Qatar's bidding? They are trying to make us love that country. Well, you would be confused until you read a story from last week that came in the Washington Post. In that, we learned that Fox signed a sponsorship deal earlier this year with Qatar Airways. Qatar Airways is an airline which is owned by the government of Qatar. Uh Uh-oh. The story alleges 
that Fox was not planning to send many people to Qatar to cover the games, and that most of their commentating crews would call the games off of monitors in the US. That's what they did for Russia. They only sent a couple of their commentating teams to Russia, and the other commentating teams called the games, they watched the games on monitors in the Fox Sports studios in Los Angeles, and that's what we heard. They weren't actually at the games. However, that changed because the Post alleges that after the deal with Qatar Airways was signed earlier this year, Fox changed plans. They now brought over a lot more staffers, including all their commentators, because Qatar Airways covered the cost of flights to Qatar, which Fox denied in the story. Fox also has a massive outdoor studio in the capital city of Doha, which maybe they wouldn't have had that if Qatar Airways didn't give them a sponsorship deal, mm, which might have included other things. Hmm. So if they actually talk bad about Qatar, Fox or the commentators on Fox could actually be breaching a contract they signed with Qatar Airways. The, you know, the government. But how they've seemingly gone over the top, they've talked about Qatar very kindly, has been bad. And remember, this is, of course, the same company. Fox Sports is different from the other stuff that News Corp and Fox Corporation, Rupert Murdoch, owns. But it's still the same company that runs Fox News. So, you know, just to remind you. Yikes! Fox Sports isn't Fox News, but it's still the same company. But that is not all. That's not all the controversies that have been going on. American journalist Grant Wall, who's been covering the U.S. in the World Cup and for many years previously, says he was detained by security forces while he was trying to get into the stadium on Monday for the U.S.-Wales match because on his shirt was a rainbow design. The security forces, he says, asked him to remove the shirt, and he said no, and they detained him. He claimed they took his phone as well, and they even detained a New York Times reporter when Wall was describing the situation to him. And then, Wall says they finally allowed him to enter the stadium after about 30 minutes of that and apologized. So, yeah, all the stuff about, oh, you can wear the rainbow shirt, the rainbow flags are fine. Apparently. Not the case. Wall also says that a couple of days ago, while getting his media credential, he took a picture of a wall that had one of the World Cup or Qatar slogans on it and was asked by security to delete the picture, even though there weren't any signs or anything around that said he couldn't take pictures. So, this seems like a very aggressive security force, which doesn't sound that great when you mix that with soccer fans. No. And this is Qatar, who were also the ones that banned beer from being sold in the stadiums just two days before the games begin, which FIFA said, okay, even though FIFA has a sponsor, Budweiser, who is definitely seeking financial compensation for that decision because they can't sell their beer there. Budweiser pays a lot of money to be like the official beer of the World Cup or FIFA or whatever, and now they can't even sell it at the stadium. So clearly, Qatar are making the rules, and FIFA are just abiding by them and not pushing back at all, even though Qatar are making these rules seemingly on the fly. And so you've got to think, there's a chance that this could get much worse. Like, who knows what Qatar is going to do. The issue, and Grant Wall, the journalist who also has a podcast, and a Substack, by the way, Sanders Weekend Facts on Substack, said basically there, that he's lucky to have an American passport. Because as we mentioned last week, Qatar are a major non-NATO ally of the United States. Could you imagine if they inflicted harm on an American tourist in this scenario? That would be very, very bad for Qatar. But in response to this, because he tweeted out a picture of his shirt, There's a lot of people who are online, and who knows what's going on with Twitter, because Elon Musk, who either doesn't know what he's doing or does know what he's doing, which might be worse, there's a lot of people online who are saying, 
you're in their country, respect their rules. Which is basically total BS. Because they're basically denying human rights and previously said they wouldn't. You know, all we heard is, oh, you can fly the rainbow flag, you just can't make out with each other, you know, in the public, and you'll be fine. Apparently, you won't be fine. We really didn't hear anything from Qatar. That's all we heard from FIFA. FIFA's hosting this World Cup. This is all FIFA, who awarded Qatar the World Cup because Qatar gave them a ton of money. And so I don't know if it's like a bunch of bots who are now on Twitter or the internet or whatever saying, you respect their rules, you're in their country, because that is just ridiculous. Now, to add on to all that, you have FIFA telling Belgium that they have to alter their second kit. They can't wear it because on the collar, it says the word love. Huh. Oh my gosh. How terrible, Belgium. How could you do that? Like, really? FIFA has also warned several European countries, including England, Belgium, Wales, Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands, that if they wear, if their captains wear a armband, a captain's armband, a one love anti discrimination armband, they will immediately receive a yellow card. So now they aren't, and they aren't happy about it. So they might express themselves. In other ways. Combine all that with the fact that FIFA's app crashed on Monday and many fans who were in Qatar had a hard time accessing their tickets for Monday's England and United States games. There were also, on Sunday, thousands of fans who were shoved by riot police with batons and shields when they tried to enter a fan zone in the capital of Doha. And to top all that off, Here's what the president of FIFA, Johnny Infantino, decided to utter out of his mouth at a press conference that happened before the games began. Today, I have uh, very strong feelings. I can tell you that. Today, I feel uh, Qatari. Today I feel Arab. Today I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker. I'm European. Actually, I am European. Not just I feel European. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons to people. Like, I'm sorry, dude, what? He said that he was, he knows the feeling of being discriminated because he was a young boy who moved from northern Italy to Switzerland and had red hair and freckles. So he knows what discrimination feels like, y'all. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's just FIFA. Good lord. I mean, this is all just an epic disaster. I am so glad that I am not in Qatar because it sounds like an absolute hellhole of a country. Qatar is trying to sports wash their way into making you think that their country is great, but it's not. Fox Sports is telling you that it's great because they were literally bought by Qatar. It's not. Their authoritarian leaders are trying to make you think, oh, we're just this nice little country in the Middle East. Nothing wrong here. No. And that's not even to talk about the issues with migrant workers, which we talked about a lot last week. I mean, their leaders, who are authoritarian, it's an authoritarian country, by the way, appear to have made it just an epic mistake by actually putting more light on the country and letting everyone know why their country sucks. That's why the sports washing is not working. They thought that they could pay a lot of money and everyone would like them because they're hosting the World Cup. 
you're hosting the World Cup, but still, everyone just really knows everything about you, and they don't like what they see. It's crappy. I mean, from the prior issues of migrant workers to everything that's going on now, it's a mess. And it's Qatar's mess, but more importantly, maybe, it's FIFA's mess. FIFA is an absolute disaster. And don't worry, because they've got the Women's World Cup coming up in New Zealand and Australia next summer, and then, oh, they're coming here, the United States. And usually the thing that happens with World Cups is FIFA comes in and they run everything. They tell the government what to do. This feels like the opposite, like Qatar is telling FIFA what to do. That, like, never happens. But FIFA's going to come here in a couple years to so the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. They're going to be like, you need to do this. No, this. No, you do this. You do this. You do this. We'll just sit back here. You do this. That's usually what happens. And it's probably gonna what, what's going to happen with the U.S. Now, the World Cup is great. Everyone loves watching the World Cup. I have had a great time watching the World Cup. But the organization that puts on the World Cup is just terrible. FIFA sucks. And Qatar sucks, too. But FIFA sucks for putting the World Cup in a sucky country like Qatar. And before that, Russia, which also tried to use that World Cup and the Sochi Olympics as sports washing because Putin wanted you to think that he has justification for doing all the things he's doing, including invading Ukraine. I mean, like, we're honestly to the point where it's like, can we just, like, get rid of FIFA and do something else? Because, like, Good grief, they are ruining this sport with their corruption. Like, it's terrible. And I bet even FIFA's going to be glad to leave in a month when it's all over. I mean, this is extreme even for FIFA. But, I mean, apparently nothing is extreme for FIFA. They'll let anything go. They don't care. As long as Gianni and his friends are getting the big bucks, they don't care. And they'll come over to the United States. They don't care. They'll get their big bucks and they'll move on to wherever it's going to be next time. So there you go. That's all the stuff that's happening on the field and off the field for this World Cup. And we're just three days in. We've got almost another month of this. Oh boy. But that is it. That's basically all I got for episode 83 of the Zaders Facts Podcast. Thank you all for listening. And remember, if you liked all the facts that I had on this week's edition of the podcast, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast. Go on all your socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Sanders Facts is there. That's Sander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell your friends. Spread the facts! Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about Xander's Weekend Facts, which is that newsletter on Substack. And you should click the special link in this episode's description to sign up. It is free every Sunday morning. Check out Xander's Facts on YouTube, episode 83, and a bunch of our previous episodes are on YouTube. Check that out. Check out the Xander's Facts link tree. It's got all the Xander's Facts links and the all-new Xander'sFacts.com to get yourself some Xander's Facts merch to spread the facts and support the facts. How about that? So that is episode 83 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening, y'all, to our little World Cup talk about three days in. Episode 84 is coming up next week. And of course, we're going to have more stuff to talk about with the World Cup because we're going to have more games coming on every day. There's going to be games up until December 18th or so, except for just a couple days. We're going to have games every single day. But next week, we're going to talk about something also in sports we haven't talked about in a while on this podcast since August. College football. This weekend is the final weekend of college football. It's rivalry weekend. Number two, Ohio State is facing number three, Michigan. Oh, that's a good one. And next weekend is conference championship weekend. So we are going to be breaking down everything you need to know about conference championship weekend. The final weekend before the top four for the college football playoff. Those rankings are released. We are already at the end of November. Next week will be our final podcast in November. How about that? So that's what we got next week on episode 84. Tune in of the Xander's Facts podcast. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 83 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening. And we'll see y'all with episode 84 next week.
Z-A-N-D-E-R-S-F-A-C-T-S.com.